We are really delighted to welcome a South Carolinian to conclude this year's Eastern North Carolina Literary Homecoming Symposium. Josephine Humphreys has traveled this weekend from Sullivan's Island near her hometown of Charleston, a beautiful city that she left after high school <coughs> to study writing on Reynolds Price and William Blackburn at Duke University where she earned her BA. She continued trekking north, completing her MA in English at Yale University, and then returned to the South, attending the University of Texas before settling in Charleston to teach, start a family, and launch her writing career. Her first three novels captured Charleston's charm, along with its racism and the dehumanizing commercialization that moved it into the progressive New South. Dreams of Sleep won the Penn Hemingway Award for the best novel of 1984. Her next novel, Rich in Love, came to the big screen in a film starring Albert Finney and Jill Clayburgh. Both of these books, as well as her third novel, The Fireman's Fair, earned the New York Times Notable Book of the Year awards. For her fourth novel, Humphreys moved away from the Charleston setting and immersed herself in southeastern North Carolina history to write her first book of historical fiction. Nowhere Else on Earth tells the true story of the Civil War and Reconstruction era, Lumbee Indian Rebellion that Henry Barry Lowry led against the Confederate Home Guard during the Civil War and then after the war against the regional whites in that area that we know today as Pembroke, where Pembroke University is. Telling the story through the voice of Henry's wife, Rhoda, a woman who defies the labels whites seek to impose upon her, Humphreys, who is the great-great-granddaughter of the Secretary of the Confederate Treasury, truly crosses a boundary as she explores, Lumbee, she explores Lumbee's perceptions of their place and their own cultural identity, and I argue more or less from their own point of view. Her masterful storytelling led to this fourth novel winning the Southern Book Award in 2001. <coughs> in an interview about Nowhere Else on Earth, Humphreys reveals her passion for the people she discovered while researching the history of the Lowry War. We certainly heard that when she was talking about them earlier today. And I'm quoting now from her words. My life and era are illuminated by Rhoda's in a thousand ways. One is that my notion of Southerness has changed because of her, because of this book. My thinking about race has changed. My ideas about community identity and racial identity, about the fate of Native Americans, these have all changed. There is a wonderful crossover between me and Rhoda. I feel that she, for a short while, inhabited me. What a wonderful testament to the power of the written word Humphreys gives us in those lines. Her reflections and her fiction inspire us all to understand our own places, our fellow human beings, and ourselves. For her compassionate perceptions and her vivid literary voice, Josephine Humphreys has received the Lyndhurst Prize and the American Academy of Arts and Letters Award in Literature. She's a member of the Fellowship of Southern Writers, and we indeed are honored that she's joined us for this year's Literary Homecoming. to have been invited to be a keynote speaker. I was invited uh, a couple of years ago to be a keynote speaker at a writer's conference that was really uh, pretty well-known worldwide, and it was in a place that I really wanted to go. And in spite of the fact that they uh, said they didn't have any money, I, w I was happy because they were going to pay for my husband to go with me, and there was a very fancy hotel. So, uh, so we went. And uh, when we got off the plane, a um, volunteer met us and said, oh, I have a message for you from the committee chairman. She said to tell you that um, um, they were able to get 
and I'll just call her Scarlett, <laughs> to be the keynote speaker. And they knew you wouldn't mind, but <laughs> Scarlett <laughs> was a very famous and very uh, cute and sexy writer of a very, very sexy novel that was on the all the bestseller list. And I said, well, of course I understand. <laughs> then she said, um, and also, you know, we had to give her that hotel room. <laughs> Great uh, B and B, and and we had a good time, and I felt you know happy because <laughs> um, there was certain pressure off, you know? and and so uh, and I was still going to give a talk, but she, I was happy to hand over the keynotedness to her, and um, and then about well in the morning of the keynote speech, um, they came back to me. This time it was the chairman herself, and not a not a volunteer. And she said. Oh gosh, I just hate to tell you this, but um, Scarlet Baghdad, <laughs> would you be our keynote speaker? <laughs> so I so I did, even though I told them there is no way that I can ever replace her or even stand in for her. Uh, so this is my second chance. <laughs> um, I thought I would talk a little bit about um, becoming a writer and then uh, about um, nowhere else on earth, and maybe a little bit about the other books, since those are the only ones left for sale. Um, and I was just telling Franny Ashburn that she was the only person still remaining that I actually know, and then two more came in. My purpose was that if everybody that I know left, then I could tell all of my jokes. But I apologize to you three, you'll hear some things you've probably heard before. Um, but I just have a limited repertoire of funny stories. They're so good that I can't replace them with any new one. Um, I love everything that we have talked about um, during this day and last night. It's always of interest to me, these questions about writing and how writing gets done and uh, what, what our southernness means when it comes to writing. Uh, how we're different, if we're different from other writers, and these things are always uh, going through my head. Um, I've always had a fondness for North Carolina from, from my childhood. Um, and I'll just read you a little section from my first novel, um, Dreams of Sleep, page 38. So this was written really a long time ago, 1980s. And it's about a family that's falling apart in Charleston, South Carolina. <coughs> um, and this chapter four is told from the point of view of the husband, whose name is Will Reese. After his father died, Will decided that North Carolina was a better place than South Carolina. North Carolina was dignified and masculine and intelligent. It had mountains and a good university town and a lonely remote shore. But South Carolina, after his father's death, seemed fat and flushed and oppressive. Will stayed in Chapel Hill during his school vacations instead of going home. He got out of English literature and into pre-med. He convinced his, self, his friend Danny to do the same. We've been kidding ourselves, he said. How are we going to make a living on this stuff? Teach poetry in junior high? We've got to move fast. Think of something. So the next day, they, sw they changed majors. The switch meant two whole summers of classes in chemistry and biology, but Will was not eager to leave North Carolina. It suited him fine to have to stay in school longer than expected. Um, I have always had this kind of envy of your state as somehow basically a saner place than North Carolina. And in the past few months, I think that's become very obvious. <laughs> but I love South Carolina. And I, I really even love our insanity. Um, I don't think Southern writing will, will ever fade away, one of the questions that was discussed this afternoon, because, because uh, we, we are so complex throughout the South, and especially in South Carolina. We've got a whole lot of bad history, and that makes for material for writers. And we've got a great deal of insanity, and that's good for writers. <laughs> Uh, and, and I just think that, um, as, as was pointed out, we, we've got enough to, to write about for centuries to come. Um, 
I want to quote another South Carolina writer who said, uh, South Carolina folks are my kind of folks. South Carolina folks are the best there is. Um, that was um, South Carolina's most famous serial killer, Pee Wee Gaskins, <laughs> <laughs> who not only killed some 30-odd or more people in South Carolina, but actually eight pieces of them. So when he says South Carolina folks are the best there are, he's not saying exactly the same thing. Okay. When I was just a tiny girl, I wanted to become a writer. Um, I remember loving everything that was connected with writing, from uh, paper and the smell of pencils to all the old books we had. Uh, we didn't have any new books, but we had books that my dad had had as a child or even my grandparents. Um, and I, I just devoured all those. There was one bookcase of books in our house. Um, and I read, before I was eight, I had read every book ever written by Edgar Rice Burroughs, who uh, is the Tarzan books writer. Uh, but you may not know that he also wrote a whole series of that Life on Mars. And that was the first literature that I was exposed to. We had one copy of um, the collected stories of William Farmer, though. And uh, it was a yellow book. I think it was a modern library book. And I read it over and over and over again. Uh, I was delighted this morning when somebody said um, that uh, Louisa May Alcott was a major influence on her life because I, mean, I, I think most women writers have read Little Women and did identify with Jo. Um, but the fact that my name was the same as hers, I think, really strengthened that identification. And I, and I, I, I wanted to be that writer. I wanted to go up in the attic and, and eat apples and, and write stories. Um, and I, because I thought I was Jo, um, that automatically made my sister become the mean Amy. <laughs> and I always thought of her in those terms. <laughs> but uh, I, I think that's, uh, you know, evidence of how children can be so influenced by what they read and why reading is, is crucial for very, very young kids. Um, the, and, and who knows which book it will be that influences them, but we should provide them with as you know, a, a many different kinds of good books as we as we possibly can. Um, and although I didn't have a lot of books, my mother took us to the library, public library, every Wednesday afternoon for children's story time, and uh, we were allowed to check out six books and then bring them back the following Wednesday. So, library people, I thank you, and uh, I, I don't think that libraries will ever uh, go away either, and no matter how. Uh, you know, no matter what happens with publishing, we will still always have libraries because we need them so much. Um, well, I wrote all the way through grammar school and high school. In high school, it was really a cool thing to do to write. We had a literary magazine, and uh, we had teachers who encouraged us to write. Uh, and then in college, I, uh, my college years were um, better than, than I could have even ever imagined them to be because I was able to study with Reynolds Price and with William Blackburn, who was, had been Reynolds Price's teacher and was really the greatest teacher I have ever had. Uh, I was really sad to graduate from college because I had to leave Dr. Blackburn. Um, and as I was telling somebody today, when the, the day that I left, um, he offered to help me get some fellowship money to take the whole next year and um, and write a novel. And I, I said, I just don't think I can do that. I, I didn't have any confidence at all that I could be a writer. And and then Dr. Blackman gave me the best piece of advice I've ever gotten. He said, remember, though, he said, someday you'll do it. And he said, remember, it doesn't have to be great. And that's an important thing for a writer to know. I think a lot of times we are stopped dead in our tracks because we think, it's got to be a really great novel, but it, it doesn't, you know, and there are plenty of good novels that um, aren't great, but we're lucky to have. Um, and another encouraging thing to writers, I think, is that there are plenty of really bad novels that get published. <laughs> Don't forget that. <laughs> um, but 
I didn't, I didn't have that self-confidence. I still thought of myself as just kind of a, a girl that liked to write, and I, I didn't think I could pull off a whole novel. And, uh, and, and, and in fact, I wasn't, wasn't really very good. Um, but I loved it so much. That was the thing that kept me, kept me writing and kept me going. Um, I went, but instead of taking Dr. Blackburn's offer, I went to graduate school. Um, at Yale in the field of English literature, and I spent a year and a half in New Haven, Connecticut, uh, the worst year of my life. Um, I realized that uh, nobody understood my jokes up there. There was a big communications barrier. Uh, I realized that I did not, I couldn't live in, in that climate. It was not only cold and snowy, but it was dry, and I and from a 98% humidity uh, atmosphere. I couldn't breathe in New Haven. So as the second year began, uh, I, I enrolled in classes again, but I, I, on the first day of one of those classes, it was a class in Jacobean drama, I looked at the window. It was around September the 20th, <clears throat> when, you know, in Charleston, people were still swimming in the ocean, and it began to snow <laughs> and I just and, and tears rolled down my eyes and I had to leave the classroom and I walked home in the snow and I called uh, an ex-boyfriend who was in Austin Texas in law school and I said what's the weather there <laughs> he said it's 80 degrees we're sitting around playing the guitar out under the chinaberry tree and I proposed marriage <laughs> <laughs> Because that was the only thing you could do in 1968, you just move in with somebody. Uh, and he accepted, and uh, we got married in uh, the next, you know, within a month, we got married, and uh, and we've been married for, I think, 40, 46 years, 45 years now. And my husband likes to say, I've heard of women who marry men for their money, but never one that married men for his weather. <laughs> I think weather is important, and I think it plays a part in Southern literature. Um, it's a, it, it's, I, was it Alice who was saying this afternoon that, that Eastern North Carolina is, uh, is like these slow rivers, and, and, and we, we do have slow rivers, and sunny days and a beautiful landscape. I think geography does influence literature. Um, and then Tom and I had two fantastic children and uh, we decided to live in Charleston even though I didn't want to. I, want, I, I didn't think it would be a good place to raise children because it's very, very conservative. And I had suffered as a child from uh, a fear imparted to me by my parents, my family, um, fear of of what other people will say about your activities, your behavior, the things you say. Um, there were several rules in our house, but it boiled down to uh, three rules. Never uh, go on the stage, don't get pregnant, <laughs> and never write a letter to the editor. Because all those things would reveal that something was wrong with you. Um, and so when I, I told my parents that I wanted to, to write, uh, they were very upset about it because that meant publishing, and publishing meant being a public person and giving up that sort of southern private shield that women had traditionally uh, been protected by. Uh, and and they, were, they were quite worried about it, and especially my father. And he said, well, if you have to write, why don't you write something useful uh, you know, uh, books about knowledge, books about trees and geology, I mentioned that this morning. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, you know, I, I, like, I like to tell stories. I think that's a much more interesting thing. And he just couldn't get it. He didn't understand um, that question that Michael asked this morning, what is the point? And uh, it took him, uh, well, it's taken him quite a long time to answer that question. He, uh, he was he was he was um, placated a little bit when the first check came in, but <laughs> beyond that, he really has not understood what I do. Um, so I so I was married in 1968. I was 23 years old. We started uh, a family, and I started teaching. And every day, I thought to myself, um, tomorrow I'll start writing my novel. 
and 11 years went by, just zipped by, uh, without my writing a single word of fiction, N nothing at all. And uh, I, I just couldn't believe that that, that that had actually happened to me when I realized that that, that much time had gone by. And I had some kind of breakdown. I, I could not go on with my life the way it was because I wasn't doing, I wasn't following that dream. I wasn't doing the thing that I had always thought I would be doing. So I found myself uh, at the college where I taught one night at the end of the first semester um, with a stack of exam books on the table in front of me and I was paralyzed. I was unable to to read them and grade them. And I sat there for at least an hour, but I think it was probably two hours. And then realized, you know, it was dark outside, it was late, and I had to get out of there. Um, so I looked at the covers of the books, the name of the student, and I, based on the student's name alone, I gave him an A or a B. <laughs> and, you know, if it was, most people I gave an A, if it was a kid who had fallen asleep in class, I gave him a B. And I handed the grades in, and I handed in my resignation. And uh, the next day I started writing. And I'd, I haven't stopped since then. Taking that, that wedding, that marriage story into account together with this one, it's clear to me that I can't change my life in little increments. I have to make a big, you know, dramatic leap um, across the abyss in order to actually make, make a change. And I, I think that makes sense. I think it's probably the easiest way to make a change is to just suddenly do it and get started on it. Uh, and, I, and I'm lucky that I was able to do that. Um, um, my husband always was all for it and, and he was glad when I started writing because I was a lot happier. Um, so the first novel that I worked on was Dreams of Sleep and it took me five years to write that book. Um, partly because of lack of confidence and partly because uh, I was under the impression that writing was made out of words and that, that's what I was interested in. Um, I wanted to write beautiful sentences uh, and it just w wasn't working and, and then I got the revelation that again <laughs> someone talked about today that I had to have a plot and that was scary. Uh, so far I had been writing about a woman who was very, very sad. And uh, all I knew was that um, she was sad. I didn't have a reason because I was writing out of my own melancholy. But I couldn't write a novel about a woman who was sad because she hadn't written her novel yet. So, uh, so I began to realize that, that the story is indeed something, a, 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 a piece of writing in which things happen. So I had to kick people to make them do stuff. Uh, and it was uh, difficult to learn how to do that. And, and I think that's why it took it so long. But finally, um, I finished and uh, sent it off to Reynolds Price, who had agreed to read it. And he sent it to his agent. She liked it, and, and it was published. Um, my dad said, people are going to think that that what you write about really happened to you, and that, that they're going to see me in your novel. And I said, no doubt, they're not going to see you. It's not about you. And he said, well, is there a dad in it? And I said, yeah. He said, then it doesn't matter. People are going to think that dad is me. Uh, a friend of mine that I saw at the grocery store um, said, I hear you have a novel being published. And I said, yes, I do. And she said, is there any sex in it? And I said, not very much. And she said, well, good, because you know if it's in there, we'll know you did it. <laughs> but the best story about my family and friends reacting to this is that um, I was at a party with my mother, and I heard her talking to one of her old, old Charleston friends who said to my mother, your daughter is having a novel published, and mom said, yes, yeah, she is. Um, and then my mother said, but you know how those New York publishers are. And I just thought, what the hell is she going to say? Because she doesn't know how those New York publishers are. She said, you know how those New York publishers are. They made her put some dirty parts in it. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was a pretty clever way to explain things to her friends. 
Well, dreams of sleep, uh, as I tangled this family up more and more in an intricate plot of betrayal and depression and sadness, and all the characters always fearing the worst, that Will, uh, the husband, every night when he comes home from work, he turns the corner and he hopes that his house is not going to be there, like it is burned down or it has somehow been destroyed, and he's, he's free. Um, Alice, the, the wife, um, has dreams about uh, nuclear war and what if a bomb hit and how would I find the rest of my family. Um, but these, these fears and, and dreams, and fear in Charleston was always one of the, the biggest things. You know, it wasn't fear really of war, but it was fear of everything else. Fear of other people, fear of other races, fear of what people will say. Um, and so I think a lot, I got a lot of that out in the book. But at the end, I wanted to wrestle this family back into a happy um, ending. Uh, and it took some doing, but at the end, they are reunited in a kind of um, happiness. And I was proud of having gotten them to that point. I, I don't really like really happy endings, but I like endings that represent like a landing in the stairway, a place from which, a place where people can rest and you have the feeling that they can go on from there. Um, and when the when the paperback of that book was published, uh, Gloria Naylor, who was a friend of mine, a, a writer in New York, uh, called me on the phone. She said, you know, I just ordered 100 copies of this book to teach in my class, but there's something wrong with it. And I said, what? And she said, they evidently uh, took out your last chapter and put somebody else's last chapter in there. And I said, what? And I called the publisher. He said, well, yeah, we had a little slip up at the printing factory. <laughs> <laughs> and evidently the chapters go down these long assembly lines in bins. But my last chapter, the bin with my last chapter in it got sidetracked and somebody else's bin was put in there. <laughs> so instead of the final scene, happy scene in the kitchen, there's the last chapter of this other book. I never have identified what, it, what the book was, but that book, coincidentally, ends in nuclear holocaust. <laughs> told me, oh, maybe it was only, you know, a dozen copies, but we finally figured out it was a thousand, so. <laughs> but Gloria actually said there were students her, in her class who didn't notice that. <laughs> the next book, the next novel I wrote just took two years, and it was a quick and really fun book to write, and, and much happier. My two children had both read Dreams of Sleep, and the 11-year-old liked it, and the 9-year-old said, I'm never going to read anything you write again. This is really depressing. So I gave him uh, the second book, Rich in Love, which is about a, a, a teenage girl. And, uh, and I was nervous the whole time he was reading it. But he read it, and, he, and, he, and the, the main character's name, Lucille Odom, a 17-year-old girl. And uh, he handed it back. And I said, what do, you, what do you think of this one? And he said, uh, Lucille Odom is my kind of girl. So that was the highest compliment that he, that he could have made. And then the third book was uh, The Fireman's Fair. I wanted to write a book from the point of view of, of a man. I had enjoyed writing about male characters in the first two books, so I decided just to you know, have the main narrator uh, be a young Charleston lawyer and uh, who has just quit his job. So it was partly my quick job quitting that influenced the, the, the plot of that book, but um, I had it be, be a male character. And that book was also a lot of fun to write. I want to just read the first paragraph from that, um, because this book was influenced by um, Hurricane Hugo um, in 1989. Uh, again, it was kind of like uh, uh, the Twin Tower story this morning when we heard that you know the disaster brought people together for a while. And the same thing happens after any big calamity in a community, and certainly happened after uh, Hurricane Hugo. And so this book opens at the, uh, on the morning after the storm. 
In his lawn chair under the Carolina sun, Rob Wyatt sat recuperating, keeping an eye on what was out there, his ruined island town, the blue yonder, as if recovery could be gained by the old southern method of sitting, mulling one's fate, watching things that don't move much. Over the deserted houses, the water tower loomed. Air stood and stirred in the oleander. Sunk in the mud marsh across the street, listing but upright, was a white piano. By now, not a strange sight among the herons and the barn swallows. For now and here, one saw extraordinary things. Past the piano was a stairway leading to nowhere, and then a four-poster bed, forlorn but inviting. Rob believed in salvage. He could have retrieved some good things, but instead he let them be as reminders. My favorite sentence in this, and you know, it's sometimes surprising to readers the way writers respond to their own works, you know, like I say, oh, I love that sentence. <laughs> um, but for me, that's the great pleasure of writing, and why I keep doing it, is that it does surprise the writer. Uh, I, I have great faith in, in a kind of um, surrender, that the writer is allowed to and is able to surrender to the writing. So I don't use outlines. Uh, I don't. I don't really. I try not to think too much about what I want to happen, and I try to make that decision only as the words are actually coming out of the pen or the typewriter or the computer. But but not to plan too much because I want it to surprise me. Um, and. When I first realized I was doing that, I thought, well, gosh, that is just that's a lazy way of writing. That just means you don't want to put the work into planning and, and outlining. But, but I count on it so much, and it's, it, it leads for me to a much better kind of writing. And, and then later I found this little essay by Robert Frost that uh, seemed to suggest that maybe it wasn't exactly a lazy way of writing and might actually be a legitimate way, but it's in his introduction to um, Collected Poetry of Robert Frost, and he says uh, that, that a, a poem cannot be planned in advance at all, uh, because you have to write the first line before you're even close to knowing what the second line might possibly be, and so on, and it, and it flows in that way. So you, you can't think beyond the first line. Uh, and he says, goes on to say, um, if there's no surprise for the reader, if there's no surprise for the writer, there can be no surprise for the reader. Um, I, I do know some writers who, who plan and who outline, and, 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 uh, and I admire them. And I had to do some outlining with Nowhere Else on Earth because it's based on a true story, and I had to cover things. But day to day, I would much rather just sit down and and see what happens, like watching some kind of continuing um, television show. And, uh, and, and, and it's hugely um, fun for me to do that. Um, but my favorite sentence in that paragraph is, Rob believed in, in salvage. And when, it, when that sentence appeared, I thought, you know, that is actually my question to Michael's answer, what, what's your point? Um, it's almost a religious thing, but I'm not a religious person. I'm an atheist who talks to God every day, and I believe in a form of salvation. I love the substitution of the word salvage for salvation because um, salvage is a secular word, but I believe in, in the possibility of, of uh, saving your characters. So sometimes if I'm writing a villainous character, I have to be careful not to not to save him. <laughs> I'm not to turn him good immediately, you know, because that is my inclination to see what is good in in each heart and in in each character. And I know it's not. A, uh, I know you need some villains, um, and I know that there are villains in in the world, but I do uh, believe in salvage. <laughs> <laughs>